I've got Atta, the odd investor. This is his YouTube channel pulled up on the screen. And I'm actually responding to this video right here, the Neo stock class action lawsuit video, where he brings up the idea that maybe Neo retail investors should target and go after maybe start a class action lawsuit against shorts. If we think they're manipulating stock price action for Neo. And so what I did is I, I kind of weighed in and, and responded. He and I, Atta and I have had a little dialogue back and forth over the last months. And, you know, I appreciate his take on things. He was an early investor in Neo before I even knew about the company. So I appreciate when he weighs in on things and even just checking in on his channel, he sort of takes you on a walk in nature and, and just talks. And so it's kind of peaceful, serene. But in this case, we're talking about this idea of shorting. And I've brought it up several times. This is in a previous video that I had where he had a question. He said, you know, FTD is another dirty game that shorts play. What else are we missing? And so I actually highlighted a, a number of things because I've been studying this for a few years now and, and there's so much more to learn. You can really get lost in any one of these, but FTDs, dark pools, high frequency algorithmic trading, spoofing, naked shorting, tokenization. And then I listed and I'll relink all of these, all these links I'll drop again for those who want to check them out. But things like they're sort of a recurring theme with companies like Citadel who have been fined in the US and South Korea and China. They were even banned from trading in China in their markets for five years. So some of these things, again, it's just kind of a recurrence that we see. And um, what I did is, you know, with respect to the video that Atta had, I basically said, hey, I'd like to do this in three pieces. The first is I'll just kind of come in and share some of my thinking with just the short CFTDs and this sort of thing. And so that's this video. And then later I'll come back and, and do kind of a separate video where we'll talk a little bit more maybe about legal counsel and what that would look like if we would want to do something like that. And then also I want to give a little more time for commenters, Neo community, retail investors to weigh in and offer their thoughts and, and, and that as well. So that we can kind of have this ongoing dialogue. But these are the notes that I made and I just created these just so I could share them on this video. This is my view, my thinking. It's kind of Simple, logical, but that's what I like. I, li I like keeping things simple so that I can understand. So for example, short sellers are shorts. They make money when a stock price they are shorting goes down. Shorts pushing a stock price down creates short-term profits for the short, and it also makes it harder for the company they're shorting to raise money. Shorts can profit heavily in the short term, especially if targeting unprofitable or unproven or startup companies that are still in the early stages of growth. I think this is why shorts don't do as well. And maybe generally don't target profitable companies as much as they do companies that are kind of at an earlier stage. So it also makes sense then that spreading negative sentiment or misinformation can work well for the shorts. Bankrupting a company could be one target or end goal of the shorts. Shorts can get squeezed. This is a risk to them because if they get caught in a short squeeze, they might have to, they may be forced to buy shares of a stock which can create or increase buying pressure, and that could cause a stock price to go up. Sometimes it rockets up in a short period of time. Now, Warren Buffett said that he considered and tried some shorting, but ultimately he decided the risk was too great. I just wanted to offer that. I thought that was kind of interesting. So this is my take. With so many dealer brokers across global markets, so many retail investors wanting to become traders and seeking that short-term profit from trading, and then in general, the short-sightedness of many market participants, both big and small investors, my gut instinct is that shorting has never been more profitable. And I think maybe an easy way to kind of check in on that or, or document ongoing is just to watch Citadel and see what kind of profits they're making, because that could validate this, but more on them in a little bit. Let's now talk FTDs, fails to deliver. Um, and this is when, you know what, I've got a clip lined up for the beast of an attorney. His name is Wes Christian, and I'll let him explain that. He'll do a better job than I could anyway. Uh, so that in just a minute. FTDs and daily trade volume appear to be two indicators of short-term price action and suppression, but FTDs are not reported real time and are at least two weeks delayed data in the US market, which means we can never have access to what's actually going on. Now, profitability seems to change to change the short's interest level, or perhaps it shifts their thesis towards being too risky. This makes sense as it becomes harder for shorts to maintain a negative narrative or poor sentiment when a company starts to show profits. Tesla could be the prime example of shorts getting squeezed as there were a few things that aligned when the Tesla stock price rocketed up. They had profitability, they had potentially years of pent up short selling pressure, 
which could have caught the shorts in a squeeze and forced that buying pressure. And then also the S&P inclusion, which created more buying pressure. All that happened at one time. And we saw incredible gains by Tesla when they actually, when that stock price really took off. So I thought that was fascinating to kind of look back and think about. Now, interestingly enough, moving forward and kind of ongoing, Tesla continues to battle shorts. And with the creation of the Tesla QETF, that's basically to target and short or, you know, or, or go against Tesla, I personally find it difficult to get a clear sense of what impact you know, that does or doesn't have with FTDs tracking Tesla. So, and that's one reason I don't really track the FTDs relative to Tesla stock price. But NEO with its historical chart of FTDs versus stock price performance seems very straightforward, more straightforward than some companies. And there seemed to be uh, an almost constant correlation between the stock price action for NEO and the FTD chart, which again is always delayed data. So we can never track it in real time. It's it's just crazy. Uh, so the historical FTD chart for NEO showed a barrage of heavy, consistent spikes of FTDs, leading to a point where FTDs dropped off. And then the stock price for NEO ran from around $3 to more than $65 within a single year from 2020 to 2021. And I got a little more specific even than that. On May 1st, 2020, the NEO stock price was at $3.18. But by November two, uh, 2020, November 27, 2020, the NEO stock price was at $54. That's less than seven months. That's an incredible move up. This appears to have been a short squeeze. Of note, NEO was not close to being a profitable company at that time. Even with Tesla's massive short squeeze, Tesla stock didn't actually see it squeeze until profitability. So this is interesting for me. Um, if NEO has already squeezed higher earlier versus so let's say Tesla stock, and if NEO reaches profitability before investors, especially shorts, expect it, does that mean NEO stock will squeeze again? That's just one of my thoughts. Another is that if NEO is being suppressed by shorts during this period of time, does a longer period of shorting mean a more powerful move up by the stock price if or when it does hit profitability? I'm talking about the company now. You know, what happens there at some point? I, I almost feel like talk about the stock price and the stock price action and the company fundamentals are completely different right now. And I do think profitability is really important for NEO for those things to kind of align. So, but those are just two things that I kind of have as, as I watch what appears to be, especially in the short term, uh, suppression of stock price and algorithmic trading. It just seems like it's the same patterns over and over and over, the exception being when we have big trade volume. And that's why I kind of watch that on the shorter time frames, just as uh, for purposes of ongoing study. Now, <clears throat> going back in time, I was late on the GameStop short squeeze, but it appeared that a short squeeze plus improper actions by broker dealers brought attention to shorts, market manipulation, and short squeezes. And then the AMC short squeeze led me to research about shorts, and I later started to connect dots with NEO and FTDs and the stock price, like NEO's apparent short squeeze. This is when Citadel appeared on my radar. In the fall of 2021, I did a video about Citadel as a suspicious short, taking a position in NEO stock. At that time, the stock price for NEO was trading above $40. Citadel as a short was also in a unique position as a market maker. And with a history of stock market fines in the US, South Korea, China, and being prohibited from trading in the Chinese market for five years, I thought this was important to bring awareness to at that time. Although I never would have believed the NEO stock price would be taken down to its current levels. Now, <clears throat> NEO is not yet profitable. The CEO doesn't hype the company. NEO is both innovative and disruptive, and as such, that can make it hard for some to understand or accept in the short term. It is a Chinese-based company and therefore is subject to a heavy dose of negative sentiment in a U.S. market that seems largely unfamiliar with Chinese-based companies. This is just all stuff that I keep in mind. NEO is traded in China, Singapore, and the U.S. markets, but also appears to be targeted in other countries or markets by shorts. And I'm going to show you something. If you stick around to the end of this, not only are you a rock star, but you might find this interesting. And I'll share all the links for all the tabs that I'm going to offer here, as well as the things from before. Now, Torchlight, MMAT, MMTLP, this is an ongoing story. Um, this is another story for anyone wanting to dive down a rabbit hole and a look at some wild price action and an apparent short squeeze with ongoing litigation. Um, Genius Group is another story that is ongoing. The CEO of Genius Group, Roger Hamilton, hosted a live stream 
called The Short War Endgame. And he featured that attorney who we're going to see and hear from here in just a second, who is perhaps the best attorney for battling manipulative and illicit shorts. Um, it also had, this live stream also had John Berta, who's formerly of Torchlight. And that's a pretty crazy story in and of itself. And Mark Basile, who is working with class action attorneys on the MMTLP case that's still ongoing again. So, um, you know, an, an interesting thing on the Genius Group, one note about that, you know, Roger Hamilton and these guys in this live stream, they're talking about it. And he said, you know, one of the things that's frustrating is other CEOs know that they're getting shorted and in some cases manipulatively shorted. And yet they're afraid to do anything because some of the companies that are shorting them are the companies they need to go and raise capital from. Now, I'll say this one thing about Neo and the CEO for Neo. I'm very, very happy that he has found a way to work around this, you know, raising the capital more creatively from folks like uh, on the strategic side of things, especially uh, with Hefe a couple of years ago um, and now more recently with the folks from the UAE. But this is from 2021. It's an interview. This is from Wes Christian's site. He's that attorney. This is Charles Payne asking him a little bit about it. So last week, several Wall Street brokerage firms quietly took steps to curb shorting against Reddit investor favorites, uh, Goldman, Bank of America, Citi, and, and, and Jefferies. They all took action. In fact, uh, Jefferies added, until further notice, Jefferies' prime brokerage will no longer offer custody on naked options. Now, here's the rub, folks. Naked shorting is, was made illegal after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So the big question is, why is this still happening? Well, we're going to ask uh, attorney advocate against naked shorting, uh, naked short selling. Wes Christian is with us. And Wes, just first, if you can, for the audience, people who are unfamiliar, what is naked shorting? Well, first, Charles, thanks for having me. Uh, naked shorting simple version is a seller sells stock that they don't have to a buyer who sees it in their account electronically, but it hasn't been delivered. And the buyer gives the seller money for ultimately nothing that was delivered. The simple version would be if you and I, Charles, took our car title and Xeroxed it a hundred times and sold it to a hundred people and each of them paid us cash, we, but we only had one car, that would be a good analogy to what naked short selling is. In Texas, simple version, we call that stealing. So that's, that's what naked <laughs> short selling is. Okay, and that would explain um how a GameStop could see 140% of the floats shorted because the same stocks were de facto borrowed and not borrowed again and again and again. No, no, no doubt. And, and there's really multiple reasons for, for why it still exists. W one is it's an enormously large problem, contrary to what some of the uh, other financial press says. For example, in 1993, uh, the fails to deliver were probably uh, several million dollars. By 2003, those fails to deliver in the aggregate were about $6 billion. According to a Suzanne Trembass book, Naked, Short, and Greedy, which came from a, the source of the SEC, just in two weeks in July, the fails to deliver were $17 billion. So at the end of the wow. day, uh, another, another study that Dr. Rob Shapiro, a former Undersecretary of Commerce, did many years ago, uh, he's with Sonicon now, uh, he did a study that showed that 500 million to a billion shares were not timely delivered, Charles. Now, to be fair, if you take that out 30 days, 60 days from when delivery should have occurred, that number goes to about half. But it is a systemic okay. problem. And, it, and it's, go ahead, sorry. So, so no, because I so, don't want to run out of time, and I, I've got a couple of other things. Hedge funds, we know, are, are, are big culprits. How, so, I mean, what do you, what's going to happen here? I guess let's cut to the chase. Will we see the SEC, will we see whoever's in charge take action on something that's happening, it's deemed illegal, it's harmful to the market? Will someone take action on behalf of individual investors? I think we're seeing a sea change. The, the, the reality is who's really doing most of this from where I sit. And if you look at the regulatory actions at SEC.gov and FINRA, it's really the prime brokers. The reality is that there are some hedge funds, but it's the prop desk of the prime brokers who are doing the naked shorting from where I sit, or market makers. Let's stop that. Market makers, uh, Citadel, of course, a market maker. So uh, again, suspicious short is what I've called them. And I'll show you a couple more things before 
I wrap this thing up. This is a little bit if you want to check into the MMTLP, the corporate action that's ongoing. And this is this is years out. So, you know, this is one of the realities. You know, if there's a short that is shorting something, they have time on their side, even if they're involved in litigation. And so that that's just something to keep in mind. This is the Torch MMA uh, T. This is when they, they changed over and then it became the MMTLP again. This is just ongoing. But you get an idea here. The stock uh, went from $3.64 on May 13th to $21.76 on June 21st. That's like a month out, you know, practically. And then it went back down roughly in the next month or so to about $3.63. It just, it's really hard to gauge some of this stuff without uh, access to all the real-time data. Now, this is the, I've shared this before, but this is the live stream. It's an hour long and it's got Wes Christian over here. Um, anytime I can find a high level attorney who's very specialized like him and I can listen to him for free, um, I'm saving money and I'm learning. So that's one of the reasons I want to share that and offer that for those who are curious. It also has, um, as I mentioned before, uh, Mark Basile and John Berta, and this is uh, Roger Hamilton, who this is kind of what he did. He, he was mad. He said, I'm, I'm getting my money back. You know, Wall Street stole money from us by shorting us. And of course, unfortunately, they their stock price has just been crushed since then. Uh, and that's that's genius. But I wanted to pull this up and let you see this because a couple of things I wanted to note here. Um, I did a Google search for Neo leverage shares and then the LSC. The reason I did the LSC, London Stock Exchange, and, and this is where you can leverage and short Neo if you want to, but check this out. This is kind of wild. I'm not going to go all the way into this site because I'm not going to agree to let them look at my stuff. However, right here, London Stock Exchange. But look what happens when we come down just a little bit. Their address, they're based in Dublin. That's Ireland. And I believe that in that long interview, I believe that one of those guys says that Ireland is one of the uh, areas of the world where it is legal to naked short. And so how interesting that there is leveraged trading going on in you know, what may be a market where that's allowed. I just think it's, um, you know, all the stuff I, I see and dig up this and much more, but I always just sort of file so much away in the background and I don't always talk about it. I knew this would be a, a longer take, a longer video, more to get through. And again, you can spend hours and hours and hours just on any one of these things, these pieces, these elements, components. So it's really hard to get a good sense of it. What, what I will say is this, you know, kind of my view is in the overview is that profitability. It's funny because my three first early like acknowledgement of this is what I'm looking for for Neo as a company. My first three major growth phases, you've got market awareness, the brand needs to be known and then profitability. And the funny thing is that profitability is far more important when the shorts are involved than when I, you know, maybe I certainly didn't have that awareness back at the time when I was kind of setting these up. I was just thinking only fundamentals, but I can't help but think that the fundamentals do align with the stock price at some point. Uh, and our teaser is, of course, Neo stock has already run. We've already seen it go. So although the narrative and the short term mindset and all that stuff, the noise, if you will, um, it seems to only get louder and louder as time goes on. I just, I don't, uh, I don't buy it. I, I don't, you know, if, if, or when Neo becomes profitable, if this thing has been suppressed and has been kept down, I just won't be surprised if we see a short squeeze. I'm not in it for that. Um, you know, this has always been a long-term play and view for me, but it's, it's sure fascinating that the journey that this is, has ended up already becoming and being. And so anyway, let me wrap this thing and, and get it out. Uh, and and weigh in, give me some feedback, uh, especially Ata, the odd investor, uh, but anyone else. Again, you know, I, I'll try to do this in two two more pieces. Now, the next would be sort of let's talk about the legal side and what that might entail, and that also gives people more time to comment and offer their thoughts on things. You know, ultimately, for me, nothing changes. It's Neo getting to profitability. That's fundamentally what it's about. I think that's very important, and I don't mind if it takes them longer. I know they have a healthy balance sheet. I've been watching that for the last few years. And especially as I became more aware of the short, you know, issues that are potentially in play. So knowing they have that, knowing that that they're actually close to profitability and that maybe even if they wait to show profitability, they might show more profitability when they do decide to show it. I think it's actually up to execs at Neo. I think William Lee and the folks over there might have um, a couple different ways that they can play this from from the standpoint of the company growth and 
profitability. So let's see what happens. I think in 2024, we're going to learn a lot and it's going to be a, a fun, exciting, crazy, wild year. Uh, but let's see. Let me wrap this thing and get it out, though. Sorry, I keep talking. It's a long video. So thanks. We'll see you all again very soon.